If we've learned anything through a pandemic, it's that you have to be prepared for detours. Whether it's your personal life or your professional path, no matter how well you plan or how clear your vision of the destination, it's a rare voyage that doesn't encounter some kind of roadblock, a surprise, or even a tragedy. I've had to take a few detours myself, but it's been in times of crisis that I've learned the most about myself and what I ought to do with my time on this planet. I've also learned that there are a few clues about how to get back on a good path. And I've gathered some appreciation for the fact that even the detours in life are not distributed fairly. I'm going to tell you about two of the greatest lows in my life and how I found an avenue to move forward again. The first happened half a lifetime ago, but I remember it as if it were yesterday. The scene is rural Niger, West Africa. My husband and I had moved there to work at a mission hospital about 500 kilometers east of the capital city. And then, after living there for about 18 months, we moved with our two daughters another 200 kilometers further east to focus on intensive study of the Hausa language. One Monday morning, our daughter Emily, who was two and a half, woke up with a fever and vomiting. I thought she probably had malaria, but a few hours later, the diagnosis became clear. She developed this horrible purple rash that is a sign of meningococcemia, a rapidly fatal bacterial infection caused by Neisseria meningitides. I realized she was seriously ill. We had to get to a hospital immediately for her to be given intravenous penicillin. So we put the girls in the back of our Mitsubishi Lancer and we put pedal to the metal, racing back to the mission hospital. As we drove, Bethany developed that same terrifying purple rash. My heart sunk as I realized she too was infected. And then, about halfway to the hospital, beautiful Emily, sitting alone in her car seat, had a seizure and she stopped breathing. In the silence of our car, as our little family sped along that highway on the south edge of the Sahara Desert, our precious daughter Emily died. It was the worst day of my life. We arrived at the hospital. We were greeted by shocked friends and colleagues. They sprang into action, realizing that Bethany was critically ill. The doctors somehow turned a storage room into an ICU and they started Bethany on penicillin. They inserted a central line to monitor her fluids, but they told us that she would not likely survive the night. My first instinct was to get out of that country and never come back. I had hit a wall of shock and grief and I could not imagine a way forward for our life in Niger. The following morning, Emily was buried in a small, rough, wooden box that had been built for her by the hospital carpenter. We watched as the box was lowered into a freshly dug grave in the rocky soil on the edge of the village. Meanwhile, Bethany was back in the hospital fighting for her life. She would go on to survive but I always remember as we stood by that grave, I prayed that we would not have to return the next day to bury our second daughter. It was our Nigerian friends who helped show us the way forward to find a path around our pain. I'll never forget the line of mourners who came to greet us quietly and reverently, but their words surprised me. Gaiswa Magida, they greeted my husband. Agaisheki Uargida, they said to me. I hankuri, se hankuri. Which translated means be patient, 
There is nothing but patience. Be patient. My cherished daughter had died and I was supposed to be patient? I didn't understand the message then, and perhaps I still don't fully understand it. But as I started to learn from our stoical friends, I understood more about coping with grief. You see, at that time in Niger, 27% of babies would not live to see their fifth birthday. In later years, as I conducted village health surveys, it seemed that there was not a family to be found who hadn't lost a young child. In fact, it was not unusual for parents to bury two or more of their children. And they died of preventable, treatable conditions like diarrhea, respiratory infections, measles, malaria, malnutrition. Our loss was devastating, but we were not special. We were simply getting a small taste of the profound inequities that exist on this planet, where some endure conditions of deep-rooted poverty, hunger, and lack of access to health care, and others, like me, are born to a protective privilege and some kind of assumption that we will be shielded from grief. It was perspective that enabled me to get on with my life, a firm, fierce perspective that the world is a very unfair place. I had known that in my head, but now I felt it in my heart. My response would be to commit the rest of my life to trying to make the world a little bit fairer. I wanted to work toward a world where toddlers don't die from preventable, treatable infections in such outrageous numbers. It was perspective that helped me navigate this unexpected detour in how we thought our life would unfold. Now let me fast forward to a different story. Not a personal tragedy, but a professional crisis. One that is fresher and from which I have not yet so fulsomely analyzed the lessons I learned. My professional crisis happened in 2019, and it's a very long story, so I'll just provide some abbreviated details here. After working for about 30 years as a family doctor, I had decided to run for a seat in the House of Commons. I believed it would be a potent mechanism to advance systemic changes to improve health at the population level. I was happy to be elected and grateful to be granted a seat at the cabinet table. Now you have to make a lot of compromises in politics. In the name of cabinet solidarity, you have to give in on some policy decisions that don't entirely align with your preferred option. But early in 2019, an issue emerged on which I could not line up with the government. I had to voice my objections, first privately, and then when that didn't work, my views had to be public. I could not remain silent, obligating me to resign from cabinet. It had to do with attempted political interference in the largest corporate criminal trial in Canadian history. Now, legal matters were not in my portfolio, but our entire democracy is founded on the principle that there must never be political interference in matters of the law, including criminal prosecutions. I could not remain silent while that principle was being violated. My resignation from cabinet, my inability to maintain solidarity with the government approach was based on the principle of upholding the independence of the judicial branch of government. An underlying but related rationale for my resignation was that I could not stand by while Canada's first Indigenous Attorney General was the victim of an assault on her character while she was simply conducting her duty with intelligence and integrity. Long story short, after resigning from Cabinet, I was expelled from my political party and forced to sit as an independent Member of Parliament. 
My political path was suddenly on a serious detour. How would I find my way back? Did I even want to continue? Should I run again? This was to become my second lesson in managing detours, perseverance. In part, I wanted to give up. Politics is a highly toxic work environment. Every day on social media, I was receiving partisan attacks, some simply telling me to go away and be quiet, some going as far as people wishing I were dead. But it was a simple encounter in a grocery store that helped me to figure out what to do. It was the spring of 2019, and I was at the Stouffville Longos with my daughter, our youngest child, Lydia. Like many other days that spring, as we went about town, strangers or friends would stop and thank me for speaking up. That day, in the frozen food section of the store, a woman stopped her cart and told me her story. She told me she had a 15-year-old daughter and that they had put my picture up on their fridge. And then she thanked me for showing her daughter how to speak up with courage. To not be a silent bystander, even if you don't know how things will turn out, even if people make false accusations against you, even if you lose your job or you lose friends who were probably not really friends. Her take home message for me was that mock Latin cliche, illegitimi non carborundum, usually translated as don't let the bastards grind you down. That was what I needed to hear. I would run again. I would run as an independent candidate. I would run for all the teenage girls who watched my story and somehow found strength. I would show them that you don't give up. I would persevere. So I did run. We ran a positive campaign with over 400 volunteers. We knocked on every door in the riding. We talked about coloring outside the party lines. In the end, over 13,000 people did something they'd probably never done before. They voted for an independent candidate. But it was not nearly enough votes to win. And I was devastated. I cried for three days, finally releasing the sadness that had been pent up for months. The sadness of a political journey ended. Nevertheless, to the extent that matters were in my control, I had not given up. Now, some will say that that detour in my journey was completely self-inflicted. I could have kept my head down, not spoken up when I believed something was wrong. I could have stayed on that political path. But for me, in that case, compromise was not an option. The day I had resigned from cabinet, I wrote, there can be a cost to acting on one's principles, but there is a bigger cost to abandoning them. Now the last lesson about surviving detours is probably the most important of all. Every journey can have detours. And I found I could stay on a track toward my destination with perspective and perseverance. But I have to admit that sometimes effectively managing a detour is a form of privilege. That was the case for me. In finding my current route forward, early in 2020, I landed the best job I could have dreamed for. I was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. And now I get to do interesting, meaningful work in a positive environment with kind and thoughtful people who want to make the world healthier and fairer. But I would not have this job were it not for a lengthy series of other opportunities earlier in life. Receiving an MD, having senior academic rank, having name recognition, each of those merits achieved largely because of a long list of unearned advantages. Now, don't get me wrong, I am thrilled to have this position, 
And I also know that with enormous privilege comes enormous responsibility to use the advantages that we have to take on the entrenched systems of injustice and the inequities all around us. But I bring up the topic of privilege because it's not right to talk about surviving detours without acknowledging that there's not a level playing field in who can persevere. In our personal tragedy in Niger, we had the benefit of being surrounded by people who loved and cared for us. We had the good fortune of being able to get access to intensive treatment for our daughter Bethany. And we had the insurance coverage to fly home on a medical evacuation so she would survive. In the case of my career in 2019, when I spoke up, causing my political tra trajectory to meet an abrupt halt, I knew that I would not be without a job. I always had medicine as a backup. I would never have to choose between hunger and silence. So every voyage can encounter detours and you may be able to navigate them with perspective and perseverance, but getting around detours is often derived from privilege or unearned advantage, like the color of one's skin or the country of one's birth. And that has to be acknowledged, lest we fall into the trap of boasting, lest we fail to see that our obligation to take down the barriers that block the path to equity for others. So if you hit a wall, I hope you'll be able to use perspective and perseverance and follow the detours until you're on that forward track again. But also look around, Take note of who is struggling to negotiate the detours that stand in the way of achieving their ambitions or pursuing a vocation. Perhaps you'll be able to use your privilege or power to take down roadblocks for others and to help someone else get back on a good path. It does not fall to me to judge the journey of others, nor to take pride that I somehow managed to get back on my feet the few times that I've been knocked down. It does fall to me to acknowledge my unearned advantages and to take responsibility to change society's patterns of injustice so each person on this planet can bear the setbacks that impede their journey so everyone can use their unique talents to pursue their aspirations and get closer to the destinations of their dreams.